Bom dia a todos e a todas. Nós passamos agora a segunda parte das atividades da manhã de hoje com a palestra é, do professor David Schallenberg. Eu gostaria de acusar, primeiramente, a presença do reitor da Universidade Santo Tomé e Príncipe, professor Peregrino Sacramento da Costa, é um prazer recebê-lo aqui, é, e também do senhor Manuel Bernardes, é consul honorário da França, em Belo Horizonte. Obrigada pela presença é, de todos vocês também. É, o professor David Schallenberg, ele é reconhecido internacionalmente como especialista no campo da educação internacional, possui mestrado em Administração e Desenvolvimento Organizacional pela Stanford University, doutorado pelo Fielding Institute em Sistemas Humanos e Organizacionais. É atualmente professor de Educação Internacional no SIT Graduate Institute, é, que é um instituto de pós-graduação com ênfase justamente na Educação Internacional, Desenvolvimento Sustentável e Administração Intercultural. Antes de assumir essa posição, atuou durante quatro anos como diretor de estudos europeus e do Oriente Médio da instituição. Tem certificação como Fulbright Specialist para assuntos relacionados à internacionalização do ensino superior, atuando também junto a organismos internacionais e profissionais como NAFSA e o Forum on Education Abroad. Tem se dedicado especialmente em estudos sobre comunicação intercultural em ambientes de pesquisa, liderança ética, consciência multicultural, elaboração e coordenação de programas de internacionalização do ensino superior na Europa, na Ásia e também na América Latina. Tem vários artigos publicados sobre o tema e está atualmente trabalhando em um livro intitulado Developing Intercultural Fluency. A, 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 o tema da palestra do professor Schallenberg hoje é justamente o tema que é, cobre esse seminário, que é a internacionalização do ensino superior com foco na pós-graduação. Eu convido, então, o professor David Schallenberg para subir ao palco. Bom dia a todos e todas. É com muito prazer que estou aqui, mas vou continuar em inglês. <laughs> uh, first, I want to uh, thank UFMG uh, for the kind invitation to be here. Um, it is a great pleasure to be talking about this important topic. Um, This is one reason why I'm speaking in English. Um, I appreciate very much the opportunity to speak in Portuguese, but I think perhaps you'll understand my English better than my Portuguese. I have, um, as a way of introduction, I have three questions that I would like to ask you. Um, I'm assuming that almost everybody here is from UFMG except for the invited persons, but um, how many people are from UFMG? Great. And from other institutions and other places? Wonderful. Terrific. Um, how many people in this room are teachers, docente. Oh, wonderful. Um, how many people have primarily administrative roles? Wonderful. Uh, students? I love having students here. Wonderful. Um, and this, just to get a sense of your academic areas, because this will help me in my examples, um, 
How many are from the uh, Ciencias Agrarias? Okay. Ciencias Biológicas. Ciencias da Saúde. Ciencias Exactas y da Terra. Ciencias Humanas. Ciencias Sociales Aplicadas. Engenharias, Linguística, Letras y Artes. Have I missed anybody? No, I don't think so. Um, I am an interdisciplinary social scientist. I come from that perspective, uh, but some of my best friends are scientists. So, um, a little bit about myself. I'm pleased to be here because I am passionate about Brazil. Um, I have been living, living and traveling here since 2010. While I live in the States now, I frequently come to Brazil. Um, and I work with institutions of higher education around the country and in the United States. I've learned a great deal since I've been here. And I continue learning. So I offer these insights, these perspectives and ideas with the humility of someone who does not know your situation as you do. So these are just my own observations. Um, I've been working in the field of international education since 1975. Um, though my, my major, my primary experience of it came as a teenager living in Lima, Peru. I've studied, traveled, worked, throughout my life and have come to realize the importance of intercultural competence um, in a world that is increasingly interconnected. Our agenda for this time together is to explore some concrete and often low cost uh, strategies or steps you can take to internationalize at home. Fabio has spoken on his interview and in other places about the importance of a culture of internationalization. And part of that has to do, a big part of that has to do with what happens here in Minas Gerais. We'll do this by first revisiting the concept of internationalization at home. Um, I'll talk about some strategies and a little bit about implementation. Um, I have asked that um, I have some, a handout to be, that, to be distributed, which is an action plan, um, which is, I think, a, a way for people to take notes about what is important to them and what they want to do. I also have a manual of strategies and examples, which is constantly updated, but it's available on this website here. The, and it, the website is also listed on your action plan. It's a, it gives more specific examples from Brazil and elsewhere of the kind of strategies that I'll be talking about today. So I'd like to focus here again on internationalization at home. And this is why. Now, UFMG is in a very special place because they have more mobility, more exchange than many universities in Brazil, than most universities in Brazil. But the UNESCO statistics show that 97% of Brazilian students do not leave Brazil during their study. They do not study outside of Brazil. Uh, though the numbers have increased somewhat through programs like Science Without Borders. We tend to think of internationalization as exchange and mobility, but that is just the tip of the iceberg here. That internationalization at home includes much more. So I think it's, it's important to note, it, note that uh, inter exchange, mobility help us in internationalization at home. They are very important pillars 
But for those students who cannot leave the country, there are many other strategies, and we'll talk about these as we go along. There are many ways to institutional internationalization, many roads to get there, and every institution has to choose the path that makes sense for it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. What I'm talking about today is a sense of comprehensive internationalization, creating, as uh, Professor Fabio has said, a culture of internationalization. And that requires an awareness, an understanding, and a commitment that is different than just mobility and exchange. I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the strategies, but before I do, I want to talk about what I call institutional readiness. I am uh, pleased to follow um, Professor Marcio's talk because this actually builds on some of the comments that you made, so thank you. I have worked with a number of institutions and I use a number of different indicators and tools as a way of understanding where an institution is in its movement towards comprehensive internationalization. These are only three of the tools that I use and I don't use them in any particular order. It depends on the institution and the context and sometimes I'm using all of them at the same time. So the first one that I'll talk about is the stakeholder analysis. And in the stakeholder analysis, um, I try to identify who has power and influence and who supports my ideas, in this case about internationalization at home. So for me, the, I, the top left-hand box says meet their needs are people who have great power but may not yet be converted to my ideas. And so I want to meet their needs, I want to engage with them, and I want to convince them of the value of my ideas. And then they become key players. On the bottom are those who have little power and little um, that I will consult with and I will promote good, I hope they will promote goodwill. Some of the stakeholders I would consider in most situations include the students, the professors, the international office, the hetor, the pro hetores, the community and potential employers. Each of these groups has a particular stake in the education of students. And sometimes there are significant differences even within these groups. Professors of language, for example, might have a very different understanding than professors of statistics or chemistry. I know of rectors who are profoundly supportive of internationalization, and I know of others who have yet to be convinced. Um, the second tool that I use is a change typology. And what it communicates and what it makes me think about is how deep and how pervasive any change activity might be. So I might say that the change that I want to create cannot be pervasive because there's some parts of the institution that are not quite there yet. Um, but there's some that are very strong and, and I can, for a variety of reasons, uh, work with them. So I might do, a, um, might do a deep, I might do an isolated, I might do a transformational.
kind of uh, change. And the last is the SWOT analysis, or I prefer the, um, the Portuguese-Brazilian FOFA. I think it's a wonderful, it sounds, it's wonderful to the ears. Um, and um, this is one place where Professor Marcio's comments really fit very well. A SWOT analysis brings together information on internal strengths and weaknesses and external opportunities and threats. In one school in which I worked, their location was a great opportunity because there were many conferences in the international organizations there and there was much international activity. On the other hand, there was a strong weakness in that they had little support from the rector and one of the key pro-rectors. And they were hopeful for the next election. Um, in another situation, there was an unstable internet. So that, makes cha that is challenging. Or th there were um, technicians that were not, there were not enough technicians to support the technological work. Um, but in both of these, the teachers were passionately committed to improve their teaching and internationalize their courses, a crucial strength. Many of the points that Professor Marcio brought up about the challenges that Brazil is facing now certainly fit in here in terms of the external environment, but also do the, um, the opportunities. So uh, let's talk about some of those opportunities. I, in, in this conversation, I'm going to be talking about some strategies and some examples. I'm also going to be talking about some research that some colleagues and I have done with uh, professors here in Brazil on the strategies that they use. And, and, um, They've been uh, professors at uh, large federal institutions around the country. So I'm going to be talking first about curricular internationalization, things that go on in the class itself. The, the first strategy is... Um, the use of readings and materials, cases, examples from outside of Brazil. And, and I would say, and I certainly encourage teachers in the US, non-Occidental, non-Western readings as well. I love this example, and it's a very simple example. It's a professor of engineering that asked his students to design a bridge for a rural community in Kenya. And he said, I want you to use materials that are available there. I want you to consider the culture, the values, the resources that might be available there. And so they were learning not only about engineering and structure, construction of bridges, but they were learning about culture. Um, in another example, which I don't have illustrated here, came from a professor of statistics who assigned a country to each student. Each student was to find the um, rate of child mortality. And in doing so, uh, was able to, um, they brought the information to the classroom and then they did statistical calculations based on regions, um, based on um, globally with respect to certain kinds of divisions and groupings. They learned statistics, but they learned about other parts of the world at the same time. There are many other examples. Um, in Brazil, in my research, 68% of the people, the professors, that we uh, surveyed 
use some type of material from outside. Um, they use data and results from research that is global. They use videos, often with subtitles in Portuguese, uh, from, sub, from sites like TED Talks, YouTube, um, the Khan Academy, uh, and other professional sites. They use graphics, images, slides from other countries and cultures. They, of course, use professional articles, sometimes saying that these are optional. While most students, or many students, do not speak English or other languages and may be resistant to some of these materials, teachers have provided translations or they've made the reading of the material optional. They've also sought to overcome the resistance by stating how important fluency in another language is and as these kinds of assignments and activities become more common, the resistance diminishes. This is why it is so important to work together throughout the institution and why this needs to be part of a culture of internationalization. Let's look at another strategy the use of Skype and social media to link students, classes, experts, and professors around the world. Skype is free, of course, but a working internet connection is always important. This strategy takes on many forms. Here's one example. This is Fairleigh Dickinson University in the US. Considering they consider their international faculty key to their learning in all of their academic areas. So they contract with professors from around the world to present a lecture, a course, a module, a guest uh, uh, speaking engagement, and um, that happens in almost all of their courses. Here's another example on a very different level, um, and this is South African students taking Khan Academy courses. Of course, this is not post-graduação. Um, it's important to mention this is very similar in some ways to the strategy we mentioned before about using materials from outside of your home country. Um, these strategies overlap, and they need to work together. I can give you some other examples. Many more are in the manual. Um, and you can feel free to explore those if you want to download it. One is an example of graduate students in Japan and the United Arab Emirates, um, who work together together in, in student groups. Again, this was just part of the internationalization of their curriculum. In Brazil, in the research that I did, and it did not include UFMG, but 21% of faculty use some form of this. Here are some of the examples um, they employed this strategy. 
at a federal institute with which I worked, an engineering professor uses Skype to bring in a guest presentation of a Brazilian engineer who lives in Texas in the United States. So he understands the Brazilian context and the uh, North American context. And because the guest speaks Portuguese, the students can more easily understand and are more welcoming. In a similar vein, I have spoken in classes in Brazil and elsewhere through Skype. And I've had Brazilians and others speak in my classes, either directly via Skype or via video recorded, uh, a video that was recorded beforehand and shown in class. Most respondents in this particular study use Skype to communicate with colleagues in other countries about shared research or professional interests. Few actually used it in their classes. Um, some have indicated that this is because the um, internet is precarious in their situations. Um, and that requires, of course, a technological fix. Perhaps by pre-recording lectures and presentations when there is a strong connection or asking the, the presenter to record a presentation at home and then send it along or post it. Of course, in that situation, you don't have the possibility of debate and discussion. Here are some comments. Um, see someone using Facebook um, for sharing materials and another for um, research and dissertation defenses. Excuse me. A third strategy is to integrate students with international experience in your classes in profound and important ways. When I say students with international experience, it could be those who have returned from studying abroad. It could be international students who are resident at the university. It could be just students who have had strong international experience. Um, I had a student, for example, in a graduate class on, on um, organizational behavior and on leadership who ex from the Ivory Coast. And he explained how the Western models of leadership just did not fit the situation in the Ivory Coast. That was such an important lesson for me and for the other students, to know that there were limitations to the materials that they were reading and that they had been exposed to. Um, in another example, cited in the manual, again, which you can download if you'd like, Japanese students visited medical classes to talk about medical practices in their home country. Similarly, fluent speakers of a foreign language can function as tutors to students learning that language. There are lots of resources available professionally, um, and there are links in the manual to these. In Brazil, um, the average use of this, um, of international students, was about 30%. Um, it ranged, and I, I put the range in here because the range was very large, from 23 to 63%. Many said they just didn't have the experience of having students with international experience in their classes. Um, but those who did certainly invited students in. And it was simply, it could have been as easy as sharing their experience. It could be facilitating research or projects in class. Um, providing tutoring to others. It could have been via Skype. Um, uh, the, I particularly like this quote because it shows the value. A fourth approach is to build the community into classes through internships and visits to internationally focused organizations. 
Of course, internships are important ways of learning in many of the areas that you represent. And um, so by putting students into organizations with international connections, they learn directly how important it is to have intercultural and international competence. You can't just put them into an international organization. They need to be in places and in functions where they have international connections. Of course, here are some of the examples. Um, in Brazil, obviously, there are many, many, many more. It is important to facilitate the learning, not just to put them in the organization. In some organizations, uh, in some institutions, they create a global certificate, which is a wonderful way to acknowledge students who have done more work on internationalizing their own learning. This is done in, in universities throughout the world. Um, I, they draw on, they give points to, they give credit to students who have done language study, participated in certain globally focused classes, have, act, have been active in international groups or organizations, have done international internships, do peer mentoring, intercultural peer mentoring, guided journaling and reflection, writing articles that are international in focus, um, attending key lectures and events, um, doing assignments with global focus and key courses. Many activities together. Um, the students earn points and they, they gain the certificate. Here is one example. In Australia, there are uh, many, many, many others, again, listed in the manual. So those are the strategies that I think are most essential in class. But there are other strategies which happen beyond the classroom and involve the classroom as well. And um, I will just cite a few of these. One is, and again, this could happen inside the classroom or outside, the um, integration of talks that are given by visiting professionals from outside of the country. Um, this can happen in, in many different ways. There may be very many reasons why a potential lecturer might be in the area. They might be here at Congresses conferences, including you'll see this one here. Um, the university might invite them for roundtables on research or areas of common interest. They might just be traveling through. In the research, uh, again, there was a widespread 22 to 42 percent of the professors in the various seven or eight institutions that were part of the research use this. Um, of course, this depends on location. Everybody wants to come to Belo Horizonte, so I didn't, don't think it would be a problem here. But um, it depends on the, on the location. This quote, I think, captures the essence of the strategy. Another strategy outside of the class, and this does not affect only post graduation but also undergraduate graduation, are cultural events. Again, part of creating that larger culture of internationalization at the institution. Um, there are many, many examples of this. I particularly love the ones of cooking, um, but video, art, cinema, um, again, many listed in the manual, many are student driven. And as it was in one Brazilian inst uh, university I visited, where the international students decided they were going to create international food and sell it um, to students and professors. 
These are also, by the way, wonderful opportunities for bringing in international visiting um, professionals to talk. There are many other opportunities uh, discussed in the manual. I understand that UFMG has a uh, residence program, uh, which is wonderful. It it's seems to be rare in Brazilian universities, but it's a wonderful creating opportunities for Brazilian and international students to be together, creating opportunities for speaking other languages. Uh, I lived in a residence in, in my a graduate school where you could only speak a language other than English once you were inside the walls of that residence. Similarly, in many universities, there are um, centers for language uh, practice. So for example, this, this diagram in Japanese near the bottom there uh, comes from what's called the E-cube in a Japanese university. When you go into those rooms, you drink um, U.S. and British drinks, you um, speak English, you have tutoring available. Um, it's fun, but it also creates an opportunity to reinforce the learning. Um, and of course, student clubs. I think it's important to note that all of these strategies have more power to them when they're done collaboratively throughout the institution. So for example, an institution might say, we're going to focus on the Middle East. And the library does an exhibit of its resources on the Middle East. We bring in guest speakers from the Middle East. We do um, other events. The Middle Eastern students uh, make presentations. There are Middle Eastern focus in the classes. And by reinforcing each other's activities, the message becomes even stronger. I want to underscore here that all of these are examples of strategies, but they have to work together. If you were to create a culture of internationalization in graduate work, here at UFMG, it's important that you're doing all of these, not some of these. Do as many as you can and reinforce them. They should reinforce each other. So uh, you are a long way from beginning. You've been doing this for a long time. So um, I just want to underscore that you may find that there are people that you have allies, programs, people who are doing research already, people who already have connections, young professors, uh, areas that are, have a lot of interest, uh, where um, internationalization at home is relatively simple, and you can start there, if in, in particularly in some of the areas that you mentioned, if you have not yet um, gone as far as you would like to go. There are workshops, uh, lots of activities that people can do. I think that um, in many situations there are workshops and um, peer mentoring. Um, create in, and of course you have many research groups that do international work. I want to underscore this particular statistic, 95%. I asked the people the, that answered the survey, how many of you want training? in how to internationalize your classes. 95% said they wanted that training and that they would participate in that training if it were offered. This is important and this is something that has profound value and impact on your students. Some of the comments that were made by respondents to the survey. Let's not forget our partnerships. Our partnerships are wonderful sources of information, 
and um, professors that can teach at a distance, like in the Fairleigh Dickinson example, sources of international materials, speakers on campus, research collaborators. I like this one, recipes for international meals, um, contact for growing our professional world, and, and of course, exchange. So how, how do you do this? And this is where that action plan comes back into, um, into action. You establish your goals. We're going to internationalize every course in this program, let's say. You establish your evidence. How will you know that students have developed that competence? You offer opportunities. You do the work, you do the activities, you evaluate the learning, and you use the results. So for example, if you're a professor, you're asking yourself, what are the students' needs? What are your resources? Who are your allies? And then you start, maybe with a module, maybe with an approach, how you'll weave it into your course, or will you uh, make it pervasive throughout the course or a separate module, and what strategies are most accessible, accessible and implementable. And then you assess it and improve it. If you're in an administrative role, and you're helping faculty do this work, then your questions are very similar, but slightly different. So what are the needs of the students and the professors? What are the resources? What are your leverage points? When you're looking at a program as a whole, where are the places where you can have the most impact? Then you decide where's the starting group um, and your approach, how you're going to train them and develop them. And again, you assess it and improve it. I think there's lots of, to me, I'm passionate about this. There are lots of important points here. I think the two most important points are that an institution cannot consider itself internationalized without a profoundly internationalized curriculum. And internationalization has to fit the students and the university. Of course, that requires being a priority of the institution, having the support, having professional staff who can help you with this, and having human and financial resources. That may be considered a lot, a lot to some people, but if you don't go down these roads, you find that there's a greater and greater gap. And students are, end up being poorly prepared for the 21st century. Thank you.